Welcome to Grace Point Community Church. My name is Jamie, and here's what you need to know. Now is the time to register for the All Church Campout, August 6th through 10th at Waterloo County Park. Head on over to our website, gracepointfamily.com, to sign up today. Also, we'll be taking communion together today, so be sure to take a moment to gather the communion elements for today's service. Now, let's worship together.
That song that we just sang sets us up so perfectly for communion because it explains for us exactly what Jesus did for us. And I just want to start out right now by just praying for us and praying that God will lead in this time of communion, make it be a holy time, a sacred time, and a time where he is present in our midst. So Father, please bless us this morning as we take communion, Lord, would you take these elements and would you just allow us to remember you? Father, I just ask that you would help us examine our hearts and just show us uh, more of what you desire for our life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I wanted to share a verse with you this morning as we start out with communion because in this time of communion, a lot of times it's a good time for us to examine ourselves. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. And then in a little bit, Pastor Steve is going to come and he's going to talk to us about 
How does the Jesus that is in us flow through us? And we're going to examine our hearts in that way as well. But this morning in Psalm 26, verse 2, it says, Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. For your love is ever before me, and I walk continually in your truth. And I love that part. That verse, it just says, examine my heart and my mind. And that's what we want to do this morning. And just a little bit after we take the bread and after we take the cup, I'm just going to give us about 30 seconds or so just to pray and just to examine our hearts and to examine our minds because... I think a lot of times we're going 100 miles a minute and there's so much going on in our lives that we forget to slow down enough and just examine and look inward and say, Lord, teach me, show me, help me to be able to see what it is that I've done maybe that I need to get right with you about and how it is that I can live more for you. And so we're going to do that this morning. But before we do that, let, we're going we're gonna to take the elements right now. We're going to take communion together. And I just want to read something for us as we take communion. Because in Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 26, Jesus was actually taking this meal with his disciples, this Passover meal and the first communion. And this is what he says to them. And this is the example that we follow. Jesus said, it says, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And if you have your bread and your juice with you, go ahead and get it now. But it says that he, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. So go ahead this morning and take and eat in remembrance of him. And then it says that he took the cup and gave thanks and offered to, the, to them, saying, Drink from it, all you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of its fruit from the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So take and drink. But right now, I just wanna give you about 30 seconds to just take some time and examine your heart, examine your relationship with God, and just say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, show me. Lord, fill in the blank. And I'm just believing right now that he's gonna to speak to your heart. So Lord, we just wanna take time right now to examine our heart and to remember you. Take this time to do that. Whatever God is revealing to you right now, I'm just praying that he's going to remind you of it throughout the day today and hopefully even continue to remind you of it right now as Pastor Steve, Pastor Steve talks to us from his word. You and I have just taken part in something that Jesus established 21 centuries ago. On the night that he gave his life for us, on a cross, he shared communion with his disciples, and he infused what we just did with profound meaning that we've just taken part in this morning. And, um, and we remember today, as he commanded us to do so, we remember him. And as we do, we quite naturally examine the evidence of His presence in our lives. That's an appropriate thing. 
Anytime you look into the face of a holy God, you find yourself kind of self-inspecting, and that's a good thing. That's a, an appropriate response, which leads to a thought as we begin our time in God's Word this morning. Let me make a statement that I deeply believe in and, in fact, is found in Scripture. It's very rooted in the Bible. The, the statement is this, the message and the mission of Jesus Christ could be summarized in the expression, Jesus changes lives. Three words, makes it real simple, but it has far-reaching implications for anybody that might be considering the claims of Jesus and the personal implication of such claims in their own life. Every time I say those words, I consider some of the things that I'm going to share in these few moments that we have together uh, this morning. Jesus changes lives. I immediately think of Peter and John. Their story is told where they were fishermen, just simple fishermen, when they met Jesus. Uh, but then later, after Jesus was resurrected and returned to the Father in heaven, when the church was ignited by the, by the presence of the Holy Spirit, these two fishermen, Peter and John, uh, were bold beyond belief. They were, they were described this way in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. When the people saw the courage of Peter and John, <laughs> listen to this, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had definitely been with Jesus. What a statement. They've gone from fishermen to changing the world they lived in because of Jesus. Or here's another example of Jesus changing lives. I think of Saul of Tarsus. He's recorded in the early part of the book of Acts as a Christian hater who, uh, as a result of meeting Jesus, became the Apostle Paul, to whom it was said, listen to this, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. And they praise God be because of Paul. This person they ran in fear from, they now saw the proof in his life that Jesus changes lives. Even people like Saul to Paul. It's a big change. I tell you folks, Jesus changes lives. Making it a contradiction if you're thinking and tracking with me this morning for someone to claim, I know Jesus, but have nothing to show for it. In the boldest possible terms the bible reports this comes out of acts 26 verse 18 jesus turns people from darkness to light and from satan to god himself you can't get wider parameters we go from darkness to light from death to life from satan to the savior that's a giant giant change and this comes out of Ephesians chapter 2, written by the human author, the Apostle Paul. Jesus causes people who are dead in sin, he said in verse 1, to come alive in Christ. See, here's the deal. Living people die all the time. You know that to be true, don't you? Living people die all the time. But Jesus reversed that. The dead came back to life. And that's true of every person that comes to Jesus. One of my favorite summary statements of how Jesus changes lives is presented in a short story of some people who lived in the ancient city of Thessalonica. It's up in the northern part of Greece, just overlooking the Aegean Sea. It's a real place today. You can go and visit it. 
But these people called Thessalonica in the first century home. And they met Jesus in, the, in their town. This church got started and it was a baby church and then it began to grow full, more full all the time of new people that were having their lives changed by Jesus. And, and, and when they met Jesus, well, as I read this, you decide the difference that he made and the report of the change Jesus brought about in their lives. This from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 and following. Um, <clears throat> For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power and with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. This is Paul describing his time there. You became Im imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering. It was not popular in that day to be a Jesus follower. It was not easy to admit, yeah, I'm different and it's because of Jesus. That, was, that took a great deal of courage and at great personal risk. And so you became a model to all the believers, Paul goes on to say, in Macedonia and Achaia, two parts of Greece. The Lord's message, listen to this, rang out from you in those places and your faith in God has become known everywhere. Still quoting, Therefore we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. And listen to this finish. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. These people were in every way different. To put it in today's terms, they had become the talk of the town. Hey, did you hear about those people over in Thessalonica? Did you hear what happened to that, that guy? That, that, he, was a, he was a tough customer. And he, was, he, he, he had a turnaround in his life. And you probably know somebody like that. Maybe you're somebody like that. I think of my life before Jesus and what he did to make me who I am today. That's not an easy project he undertook, but he stays with that job. In fact, said elsewhere, the work I began in you, I will stay on the job until the day I come for you. Philippians 1 verse 6 tells us. It's great news. So what specifically was being said about these Thessalonians, the Thessalonians that were being talked about everywhere? Let me read verse 9 again because it's worth repeating. They themselves report, they tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They, 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 it showed. You, you, there was no secret to this. Something's different about you. As I'm asking in this talk, is your growing, showing? The, the, they were new and there was little doubt that new was shining through the way they lived. A little over 37 years ago, um, my bride Debbie and I exchange vows, and uh, right after we were married, actually in, on the East Coast, in Lanham, Maryland, on Good Luck Road, is that cool or what? So right after we were married, we took off the next day on our honeymoon. We flew down to Florida, Jekyll Island, Georgia is where we honeymoon. It was really cool and magical, and, um, and, and, and um, I, I still remember uh, something that must have stood out about us. Uh, we didn't announce, we didn't carry a sign that said, I'm different, I'm married, I was single yesterday, I'm married today. None of that. But um, I'm not sure exactly what people saw, but they must have seen some kind of glow. Because from when we went to the airport, the man looks up, the, 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 the agent, the ticket agent, and he says, so welcome in. How are you guys doing? And he throws us this look like, wow, you're, you're not just 
two young people, you're, you're special. And, and, uh, and he said, do you have some news to share or whatever? He had no way of knowing. And we told him, well, we, we just got married yesterday. He goes, he kind of went like this, like, I'm going to warm myself by, by the fire that I see here. And you know what he did? He upgraded us to first class, which frankly is the only way I like to fly today, okay? It was really cool, but that was only the beginning. We had hotels who, who took us from a regular hotel room and said, oh, oh no, a suite for you. And, and then I lost count how many bottles of champagne we were given. It, it was the big deal, and I don't even like the stuff. I mean, we're packing champagne around like it's important to us, you know? Uh, what did people see? <clears throat> They saw something in us. They saw something new and exciting. They saw something wonderful. They saw the stuff of fairy tales right in front of them. In the words of the New Testament, listen to this from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone, let me stop and include you, because anyone means in another form of the word, everyone. Okay? So if anyone, that means not just a few, you and you, but not you. No. If anyone, if anyone is in Christ, that means has trusted in Jesus and had their <clears throat> sins forgiven by the one who took their place, that person 2 Corinthians 5.17 announces, is a new creation. The old is gone. Not going, going, gone. The old is out of here. And the new has arrived. It has come. Which raises a couple of questions. Have you turned to God? You're hearing me this morning. Wherever you're listening, some, of, some are traveling, some are on the road, some at home, an apartment, maybe camping. doesn't matter where you're at, but I've got to ask you the question again. Have you turned to God? Uh, do, do you believe in Him? But that's not enough. You must belong to Him. There's a lot of people that go, yeah, yeah, for sure. I give God credit for creating, but I'm not going to call Him my master. I'm asking the bigger question this morning. I think the Bible is. Do you not only believe in Him, but because of a change in this relationship, you now belong to Him? That's what God wants. And He patiently waits for that. Uh, it's really the question, does the Jesus in you show through you? Uh, let me show you something in the second letter that Peter, the fisherman I talked about earlier that turned pastor, states. Um, and he states that God's great power is in fact the ultimate game changer. Okay, so hopefully you're finding your way to 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, where the apostle announces that because of God's great power in what he did with his son's death and resurrection, because of that, it is the ultimate epic game changer. Um, so Second Peter, I begin in verse 3, and it just says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these He has given us His very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires." Through His divine power, He has given us a new nature. And that's true of everyone who believes. 
the divine power takes over there and says, you got a brand new you on the inside. It's me. The, the change is nothing less than you stepped off the throne and now I'm on it. Okay? I'm in your life. The, the divine power has given you a new nature. Uh, and that's true of all who believe. Secondly, uh, through his divine power, believers escape, he says, the corruption of the world. Verse, verse 4 ends. Uh, the, the corruption that's everywhere that we look in our world today. His divine power lets you escape from that. And here's a third takeaway. Through his divine power, and this is where it gets really practical, believers can live truly godly lives. That was not possible before I came to Jesus who gave himself for Steve. Peter has our attention, doesn't he? Uh, God's great power is a game changer in all who believe. So let's get more detailed here, more into the, 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 the depth of what's being said here. How so might be the question you're thinking. He tells us by connecting something, believing in Christ and behaving or living like it. Living for Christ. So he gets practical by listing eight actions. I want you to just see them one after the other. We're not going to go into detail with them. You get to do that on your own, just as I have. But here's the deal. There's eight virtues that are listed beginning in verse 5. And these are, uh, think of them as fruits that should show through people who don't just know about God, but they belong to Him through Jesus. So let me read them, and let's, let's take a little look at them in our own lives. For this very reason also, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. To your faith, goodness. And to your goodness, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly or mutual love or affection. And to mutual affection, Christian love. So there's eight ver fruits that are being identified here. As I read them, were you thinking about yourself? Do I have faith? Does it result in greater amounts of goodness in me? And does my early baby understanding of what Jesus did, has it grown? My knowledge, has my knowledge grown? And with it, self-control, do I find greater success against temptation? And to self-control, am I persevering? Do I wilt fast when, when, when headwinds hit me? Or do I persevere through them? A mark of fruit of Jesus in your life. Do, does my perseverance result in greater godliness? Where I'm getting close to being asked by somebody, were you with Jesus? That's godliness. There, there's something drawing their attention. You're a standout kind of person. How about this one? Mutual affection. Do I have brotherly affection? Do I... Do I, do I love my brothers and sisters in Christ? And then he goes even further than that to the general category of love. Do I have this kind of sacrificial, self-initiated love? There's, that's quite a list there. So, uh, we need to do a little digging, I think. Uh, call it fruit inspection, because I'm asking questions. But let me remind you what the Bible insists. This is not the time to inspect the fruit that you see or don't see in the person that you're watching this with. Or somebody that's not with you right now, but you know about them and you're thinking, not so much. No. The Bible puts the emphasis on you and me inspecting fruit in our lives. Okay? So follow that with me. While, while you're starting to kind of get a look around your own life, measure this in you. 
The more you get to know Jesus, which is how verse 2 begins, grace and peace to you uh, be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. So the more you get to know Jesus, the more it should show that you have been with Jesus. Watch verse 8 now. We didn't read this yet, but let me read it now. Verse 8 says, If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that descriptive of you? He who possesses these qualities will be more and more effective. They will not be unproductive. They will be hugely fruit-bearing in their relationship with Jesus. Um, Is that true? Do you see that happening in you again? It's just about you. Um, Don't confuse. I tried to allude to this earlier, but let me repeat it. Don't confuse knowing a lot about God as the same thing as knowing God. There is a difference. Uh, As I was warned when I went to seminary, Uh, from some people who really love Jesus. They pulled me aside, and they loved me too, and they said, Steve, you're about to uh, enter an experience that that will expand your understanding of God, blow your mind, they said to me, with a greater and greater amount of information and understanding about God. And they said, and that's a good thing, comma, Then they said, when this happens, remember to fill your heart as well. And then they added sort of this ominous sounding threat or warning. Don't lose your faith over 12 inches. From your head, a whole bunch of new information, but it never made its way down to the sort of the command center your heart. That was huge. Peter's words in verse 8 issue the same warning. Guard your heart from becoming ineffective and unproductive as a result of just filling your head, but somehow starving your heart. Don't do that. That's, that's easy to do. Not just for pastors who are in the book all the time, but for people that just kind of get a little religion and call it good. It's way more than that. Here's the way Jesus put it, this point Peter's making. The night, the same night that he shared communion uh, before giving his life on the cross. He said this in chapter 15 of the Gospel of John. And he said it to his disciples, which numbered 11 by that point. Judas was already out of there. These are his words. If you remain in a close relationship with me, then you will bear much fruit. And then he adds, for apart from me, fruit won't show through. Why? Because it won't be in you. You're going to be making this stuff up. You're going to try to be good on your own. You're going to try to be self-controlled in your own strength. And on and on that list we read in verses 5 to 7 goes. You can't do it in a sustainable way. That's why you've got to remain in me, Jesus said in John 15, verse 5. I just read. So here's a second thing to notice as you nose around like you are right now, your own life. The lack of these eight fruits points to a problem of both vision and and memory. Look at verse 9. It comes out pretty clearly. Whoever does not have these qualities is nearsighted and blind. That's vision. That's a vision problem. Forgetting what they have been cleansed from in their past sins. That's a memory problem. Uh, Peter is saying if we lack these virtues, there's a problem with our sight. How so? Well, by taking our eyes off Jesus, we try to do it on our own. And, and, And... our problem becomes one where we think we can get good without the help we need to be good. 
And that won't happen. That's, that's a nearsighted and blind problem. But Peter is also saying if we lack these virtues, it may, in fact, be a memory problem. How so? Well, a forgetfulness of the fact that you have been saved from darkness and from death and from the devil. It's huge. He delivered us. He set us free. He's, he's forgiven us. And he's replaced, I love to, to tell you this, he's replaced your old heart. He didn't just fix it. It was not fixable. He took out your old heart, Ezekiel 36 tells us. He took out your old heart, he described it as a heart of stone, and he replaced it with a new heart, a heart of, of love, flesh. A place where he can work. Is he working in that place today? Let me repeat my question again. Is the new showing through? Is, is, is your growing in Jesus showing to people around you? I can't read from Peter without remembering something that he could never forget. And I'm pretty sure Peter had learned a painful lesson from his past when he, he failed not once or twice, but three times a single question quiz he was asked when they arrested jesus hey 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 hey! aren't you one of his close friends nope repeated nope repeated again nope he failed it three times we're told in john 18 and i suspect i suspect that that memory for peter who's the author of this passage we've looked at closely um, that, 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 that probably is behind his parting plea in verses 10 and 11. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm who's calling. Your calling. Take a look at your life. Don't get your eyes on somebody else now. Or you'll miss the point. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Look how he finishes this section. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Make sure, he's saying, that you truly belong to Jesus. I'm just going to go a step further and say... Maybe you're looking at this list, faith, supply, moral excellence, moral excellence, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self and all that, and you're going, that's there occasionally, but not all the time. Or it, it was there, but it's kind of missing, maybe completely missing today. Will you hear my heart? This is that time. Make sure that you belong to Jesus. Maybe, maybe you had a, 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 a kind of a, a look in his direction, but it never went anywhere. You never really humbled yourself and said, Jesus, make me new. Like 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we read about. Maybe it didn't go that far for you. And so for a little while, you were, you were improving. It was kind of sin management. But that didn't last. And you're back to you. Paul, Peter's saying, make sure that you truly belong to Jesus. Being with Jesus for eternity is at stake. There couldn't be a more practical and pressing question. This is not academic at all. Do you belong to Jesus? Peter is saying here. Make double, triple, sure. And can I just say this? Um, if you're, you're coming up with unclear or unsure, would you please take the time to just, just email gracepointfamily.com you'll find ways to connect with us there a comment or a connection card would you just fill that out and turn that in and just say something like you know i'm not really sure uh i want to i want to talk more about this think more deeply about these things and one of us one of the pastors will get back to you and we'll talk with you and we'll just engage in a conversation it might have to be a zoom call or whatever it is for now would you do that Would you pray with me as we wrap up and sing? 
Lord, I look forward. I think anybody that knows you, truly knows you, look forward to the day where I'm with you. I do my best to talk about you and to explain things about you, but I can't wait to really see you. And, and I want to thank you for what you did to make that not only possible, but a promise I could hold on to. And I do. Uh, you want all of us, not just me or a few. You want all of us to leave darkness and come and live in the light of your love for all of eternity. Your desire is that not one perish without knowing you. So I pray for people hearing this today who might be on the, on the fringe or on the, on, the, on the fence, not quite sure, does this work for me or is it true of me? And I, I need to think further. Um, I pray that this would be the, the nudge to move them forward, to, to really figure some things out. And, um, and I would just pray, Lord, until, until you welcome us into your presence. I, I pray that you would continue to bless us, your people. And the Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together, church.
rejoicing. He is for you. 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 probably saying all the time <laughs> and all the time God is good thank you so much for joining us today we just love you as a church we love you and just pray that you would be blessed